Hello and welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Poorman. The Bloomington Metropolitan Planning Organization Policy Committee discussed the Indiana Department of Transportation's statewide 2020 safety performance maximum targets. Senior Transportation Planner Pat Martin said that the city does not want to exceed projected target numbers. He spoke at the January 10th meeting. Now the targets given to us, these are the maximum targets, I'll show you that. I, I don't want to say that we want to exceed these, we want to come in less than this. These are statewide numbers. Uh, the statewide numbers based on a five-year rolling average is 965 fatalities, is what they expect in 2020. Uh, 3,628 serious injuries, this is statewide. <coughs> a fatality rate per million, were per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, 1.154. Serious injury rate, again, per 100 million miles traveled, 4.342. And then the total number of non-motorist fatalities and serious injuries, 420. Now, the non-motorist includes not only bicycle and pedestrian, but it also includes what I would call horse-drawn vehicles. Martin said numbers are up in all areas. Committee member Margaret Clements said motorized scooter accidents need to be included. Martin said scooter incidents cannot be recorded. If I might add, scooter data is not collected by the Indiana State Police. It's not on the state police form, which all law enforcement agencies in the state of Indiana use for reporting crash data. So in other words, they fall through the cracks currently. The Department of Transportation is working with the state police to add scooters, a scooter item, into the report, uh, which state police would have. But as of now, it, within the state of Indiana, it's just not recorded. The committee adopted the presented 2020 maximum targets with added language. A city and county convention center joint session was held on January 13th. Officials discussed land reserved for the convention center expansion. Commissioner Julie Thomas proposed granting expansion land to a capital improvement board after deciding on the expansion location. The CIB working with the architect selects the site for all of these components. Once those sites are selected, um, it is our intention to then, that property that's included in those sites would then be um, given to the CIB. Deputy Mayor Mick Renison said the city intended to grant the CIB access to all innkeepers tax land. He said CIB efficiency would be increased by controlling all innkeepers land. Um, our perspective is that the land that was purchased for by the innkeepers tax all of it should be put into the CIB's control. Uh, and that's to be equitable about the resources going into this. If you consider carving out some of the land, then the CIB and the future convention center's needs may not necessarily be met if they need to sell land to uh, finance an aspect of the convention center. Of course, they'd have to go through and get permission from the entity that controls the land anyway. But we really think it all should be dumped into the pot. Renison said landowners can reobtain land from the CIB. Commissioner Lee Jones asked Renison when land could be removed from CIB control. Well, I would want to, to specify what that period of time would be because I think it, it's just, I, I don't think it makes sense to just say this is going to sit here forever because maybe sometime in the future something will come up. That seems reasonable to have some sort of a, mm -hmm. uh, at least a let's visit it in X number of years and see if it has any purpose or intent that the CIB or the elected body C could be useful or not. Attorney Margie Rice said land use should be more selective. She said only necessary property should be included. We were thinking about being narrow mm -hmm. and precise mm -hmm. and not adding um, and the reason I think, you know, to go to um, Nick's point about, you know, the city is putting in what is necessary for this project, and the county will put in what is necessary for this project. Nobody should put in something that's not necessary for this project. Um, 
and I don't know that anybody could say that the land south, you know, on Second Street is going to be necessary in the immediate future. Jones said it is not fair to hold land for an improbable southern expansion. Officials will vote on a revised interlocal agreement to be implemented on February 10th. Ellettsville Town Council discussed a flood report following last weekend's rain. Interim Town Manager Mike Farmer reviewed flood procedures in the January 13th meeting. We call out uh, um, employees from Department of Public Works on Saturday morning. Uh, we'd had about three and a half, four inches of rain. <clears throat> we uh, went through the sandbag routine. Uh, downtown and um, we got lucky I'd say another half inch of rain or another hour of rain and we probably had a, a considerable uh, flood on our hands the creek breached in three or four places and um, it started re uh, receding uh, probably about one o'clock Farmer said crews were quick to respond resident Jill Thurman said many people are affected by the flooding we've lived on Vine Street about nine years and in those nine years, we've had to replace our furnace, our water heater, um, our deep freeze. We've had to replace our washer and dryer three times, and we're the lucky ones. Um, there was a woman down the street from us that lost her two dogs in a flood. Um, there was a man that lived right down, um, just two doors down from us, and he was sitting on his bed in the cold December water waiting just not knowing what to do. He, he, he didn't know what to do, and luckily he was rescued um, in time, but he was, he was wet, the water was up on his bed. Thurman said she hopes council will work toward flood mitigation in 2020. The Department of Natural Resources submitted a flood mitigation plan. Trinitas Development requested approval of a planned unit development with amendments for North Arlington Park Drive and West Arlington Road. Trinitas Manager of Design and Development, Kimberly Hansen, presented development plans to the Bloomington Plan Commission at their January 13th meeting. Again, there's four primary areas of development that emerged as we were going through this. Area A is the single family lots that we will develop and make build ready to be conveyed to the City of Bloomington for the purpose of workforce housing. Area B is townhomes. Area C is that four-story multifamily and limited commercial building, and Area D is primarily cottages or duplexes. Hansen said reserved green space is about 35% of the site. Commissioner Jillian Kinsey asked about access traffic. Traffic engineer Adrian Reed said site access delays are expected. The result would indicate that the, uh, the delay in entering and leaving the site during peak hours um, is at a certain level of service, which is just a measure of delay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the worst case is a level of service E, which is a 45 second wait yeah. or something thereabouts. So um, it, it, it ends up uh, um, being a little bit uh, of a delay during peak times uh, uh, to and from this site. Mm -hmm. um, the, and, and as I stated before, the result uh, of that is mostly due to uh, existing or, or, or projected traffic conditions uh, on 17th Street and Arlington Road. Zoning planner Eric Grulick said further traffic studies will be performed before final plan approval. The commissioners approved the PUD as amended. Commissioner Jarrett Alexander reported on an Iowa City curbside compost program in a Bloomington Commission on Sustainability meeting on January 14th. He said a range from single-family homes to fourplex apartments receive program benefits. So they financed it through a $2 line item on the monthly utility bill for each curbside customer, um, and they used that money for continuous or for maintenance and upkeep of the program and to purchase the carts for the customers, the curbside organics carts. Alexander said Iowa City reported less organic waste in landfills. Commissioner Dave Rollo said city efforts should focus on encouraging residents to compost on site. And we spend about $900,000 a year, I understand, on leaf pickup, curbside leaf pickup, which to me is a bit insane. 
uh, since we're driving trucks around using a lot of fossil fuels to vacuum up leaves and take them somewhere when they could just simply be composted on site. Rallo suggested city distribution of compost containers. The next Commission on Sustainability meeting is on January 28th. And we will have more Cats Week after this message. Let's talk about sex. What is consent? And what's not? Consent is based on choice. Consent is active, not passive. Consent is giving permission without feeling pressure. What is not consent? Silence. Passed out. Intoxicated. Fear. Is it not, is not consent. consent. Got consent? Ask. Sex without consent is a crime. Only yes means yes. Welcome back to Cats Week. Beth Hamlin of the Monroe County Prosecutor's Office requested approval for a fund-to-fund -fund transfer for compensatory time pay. She requested the comp pay at the January 14th Monroe County Council meeting. This, I'm proud to say, is um, some comp time that we offered to gather some data for the criminal justice uh, survey that was going, um, that you're waiting for the report on. We allowed our legal secretaries to work some comp time. And then shortly after that uh, data collection ended, one of our legal secretaries moved to a different job in court services. And so this is a request to pay 20 hours of comp time and associated FICA and PERF. The council unanimously approved the comp pay. The Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees voted on a proposal for a fine-free library. MCPL special audience strategist Chris Jackson presented the proposal. He said fines create barriers for many families. He spoke at the January 15th meeting. So instead of being uh, charged a fee upon returning something late, we're instead going to notify people more frequently uh, about items that are past their due date. For people on email and telephone notification, they actually get a reminder before the due date, and then more reminders between when the item was due and when we bill. We're also moving up the billing date. Currently, we, uh, under the proposal, currently we bill at 40 days past the last due date. Uh, we want to instead change that to cut it basically in half to 21 days, and it's, it's 21 because that matches the 21-day checkout period for most items. So if you are behind in your borrowing, you'll get a bill for the, for the cost of the item much more aggressively than you do currently. Uh, in almost all cases, that bill will exceed $20 because books and movies mostly cost over $20, and that becomes a hard block to continued checkout of the library. So there still is a significant penalty. The, the benefit to this system is the penalty is really removed entirely once the item comes back. Jackson said without fines, many people could be inspired to bring back overdue books. The trustees unanimously approved the proposal. Director of the Monroe County Planning Department, Larry Wilson, proposed formulating a new consolidated development ordinance to the county commissioners. He proposed a contract with land use zoning consulting firm McBride Dale Clarion. Wilson spoke at the January 15th meeting. So it's really a diverse county to address. It's not just a cookie cutter type situation uh, that you can just apply one ordinance from a, a different location to our county. We have unique uh, concerns. We have limestone extraction. We have uh, logging. Uh, we have the, the demand for recreational facilities. Um, we have large industrial complexes that a lot of rural counties don't have. They don't have all the employment and uh, industrial sector that we have on the west side. Uh, they don't have airports at least the scale of airports that Monroe County has. Wilson said the suggestion of McBride Dale Clarion was based on previous Indiana zoning work. He said McBride Dale Clarion is experienced in both rural and urban residential zoning. Wilson assured the commissioners of community involvement in the ordinance drafting process. And I want to note that this is a, once we start this project, it's not a case where they will submit the zoning ordinance and say, here it is, sign it. There's going to be involvement along the way. We have, we'll still be public involvement, there'll be public hearings. Uh, there has to be public hearings by the plan commission, 
and there has to be public hearings by the commissioners before we pass this. Wilson said consulting firm Clear Zoning could be hired to create an online accessible ordinance. He said the contract is dependent on approval from the county council. Commissioner Julie Thomas voted no, while the remainder of the commissioners approved the proposal. The Monroe County Commissioners discussed extra county jail maintenance help in their work session. County Attorney Jeff Cockerell presented the position on January 15th. The jail, um, Sam, Commander Sam Crow and uh, the ASI, and there is a need for additional maintenance time in the jail, and so I've worked with uh, ASI to, to get a price of uh, for 40 additional hours per week of maintenance time in the jail, and that price is uh, $1,750 biweekly. Uh, we don't have uh, this appropriated in any sense. The request for additional appropriation will be considered in the County Commissioner's February meeting. Monroe County Redevelopment Commission discussed new tax increment funding legislation in their January 15th meeting. County Attorney Jeff Cockerell said affordable workforce housing would boost the city economy. Commissioner Efrat Pfefferman asked Cockerell if legislation allows TIF conversion. Do you know if, if this allows for um, an area that's a current commercial TIF to convert to a housing TIF? I, not necessarily in its entirety, but maybe a section of it? Well, what I think is, and, and, and the reason is, is because between this TIF and, and the other housing TIF, the other housing TIF has that you can have such a percentage of a current TIF be designated towards housing and that that so it's, so I'm trying to answer that question knowing that um, if it's in a current TIF that you could do a percentage and I want to say it's not more than I want to say 25 percent or 20 acres back in, in that realm um, I wouldn't see any reason if we had it in a current TIF that we couldn't do similarly to what we did with the, the Curry profile TIF, which is, you know, kind of end it for that and then begin a new TIF. And so I, I think that that would be kind of my perspective is that I, I think you could do it with a current TIF, but I think you could also change that TIF so that it's a carve out of a TIF. And I also think you could do it on somewhere that it's not had a, a current TIF district on. Cockerell questioned if school capacity could allow for an influx of workforce families. Member Dana Kerr said there is a possibility of insufficient space in the Richland Bean Blossom School District. Cockerell mentioned a lack of sewer expansion options. Commissioner Lisa Abbott said utilities drive up living costs. And I think that's what's happening to our market because all of those costs are, are expensive and, and it's often difficult to expand those services. So what happens, and you have to have a certain amount of acreage to do um, a septic system, so what, what we're seeing that's getting built is very expensive housing. And that's not serving the market that we are trying to serve and it's not going to help us bring in the employee base that we're trying to bring in either. Pfefferman said the Redevelopment Commission will continue to explore options. At their January 15th meeting, the Bloomington City Council approved the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program's Economic Development Notes and Loan Proceeds. City Attorney Larry Allen said loans will be used to renovate public housing. Uh, if you look at Section 5 of the loan agreement, it specifically specifies that in these instances the city does not bear any uh, general obligation for these bonds. We don't back it up. It's backed up by the project. What we are doing essentially is lending our tax-exempt status and our status as a public entity to do these economic development pass-through bonds. Executive Director of the Bloomington Housing Authority, Amber Scobie, said the Housing Authority will continue to pay tenant utilities. She said renovations will affect three areas. So our plan is to do a portfolio conversion. Um, so Walnut Woods and Reverend Butler, are two of the communities we operate, and then um, starting this summer, we'll, we'll start thinking about pre-development work and how to finance um, the renovations for Crestmont, which is our largest community, 196 units. The approval passed unanimously. 
Curry Urban Properties proposed a district ordinance and preliminary plan to the Bloomington Land Use Committee. Approximately three acres were proposed for density housing near Park Ridge neighborhood. Development Services Manager Jackie Scanlon spoke at the January 15th meeting. We do think that the PUD offers unique architectural design and range of benefits and features for the tenants. They also are obviously um, including housing stock that has much needed in Bloomington, including diverse housing with the uh, inclusion of the workforce housing. Um, and we believe that that is uh, uh, moving in the right direction of what the comprehensive plan um, is requesting and especially being in the area um, of the regional activity center and the edge of the focus area that the um, that the density and size of this project um, though larger than what is there now um, is appropriate. Curry Urban Representative Steve Brehob said an addition of large sidewalks is planned. Commissioner Steve Volan asked for traffic studies of nearby roads. Park Ridge resident Steve Akers shared neighborhood concerns of traffic, noise, and shadow pollution. In our area, which we're basically bordering Cambridge Square, Longview, uh, to the bypass and Smith Road, that square mile, actually it's 0.8, it's not quite a square mile, it, it adds up to 2,375 apartments, 100 condos at roughly three people per and not even putting the homes in that we're at a density of 7,475 people. So that's roughly, that's twice the density of the average square mile in Bloomington. The petition will be reheard in a January 29th land use committee meeting. Solid Waste Management District Executive Director Tom McGlasson reported on Green Camino's interest to expand compost services in the January 16th Solid Waste Management District Board meeting. Board member Julie Thomas said few people use the service. She questioned McGlasson on the expansion. So why would they be interested in expanding if there's only eight or nine subscribers? Uh, they've indicated to me that, uh, you know, they, uh, they have a, a, they're curious they, or they, and they, they, they have a belief that, uh, you know, just because of the demographics served by the various sites that other sites might have more uh, participation than the Bethel Lane site. The next Solid Waste Management District Board meeting will be on February 13th. And that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman.